for anyone who's watching this, if you don't know who he is, go check out his TikTok. He's about 55K over there. His YouTube, Instagram, I don't know if he's going to start posting on YouTube. I'll start you posting on YouTube soon. Soon I'm going to start posting on YouTube. I got I to gotta find a niche. I got to find a niche in uh, you know, what I should post because, you know, a lot of... A lot of people ask me to do like vlogs and stuff like that, but I don't know how to use the camera. So I guess I got to learn how to use that. So I'm going to start posting on YouTube. Yeah, that's definitely the hardest part is figuring out what you want to do on YouTube because on TikTok is a little bit easier to know short format that. And then when you move over to YouTube and it's like a five minute video, it's crazy how long five minutes is when you actually exactly, get yeah. <laughs> get down to it. So first of all, for those of it, for everyone who doesn't know, Nazir plays for Georgia. He plays for the Georgia Bulldogs. He just won back to back national championship defensive tackle. Some might say he he looks a little bit like Jordan Davis, as, <laughs> as I've seen, went on um, uh, during last season, during that championship run. So, first of all, what has that been like, being back-to-back -back national champions? It is a, it's, it's a great accomplishment, man. Like, we're all excited. We we're all excited. You know, it's in the past now. We can only move towards uh, something something better and something new. And, um, you know, it was, it was very exciting. It's unbelievable. You know, we accomplished it. Uh, and it's something that we stressed all throughout spring and the summer and fall, so like that. And so, you know, after we, um, you know, won the SEC against LSU, we just, you know, looked more into, the, you know, greater accomplishments and going back to back was one of them. And, you know, a lot of people, well, I wouldn't say a lot of people, but the naysayers that said we couldn't do it, we just proved them wrong. And, you know, to play at TCU and win like that is crazy. It's crazy. Yeah, so what was that like? Because I think heading into the uh, national championship run where you guys played Alabama in the national championship, you guys played them in the SEC championship. I think heading into the, that season, they were the favorites and then you guys eventually came out on top. So all, all, all off season ha after that national championship, you have 15 players heading into the draft. You guys lose a bunch of starters. What was that conversation like in the locker room? I know it's, um, it's a little bit different from the NFL where you guys have such a good uh, recruiting base and you have so many different guys so many talented guys in that locker room but what was it like having to overcome that in the offseason what was the preparation like with losing so many starters to the to the draft and also just graduating it's like you know i mean we we, we had a lot of guys uh that we knew that we wanted to put on the field you know including me uh and a couple of other great players on my team of course like any everyone has to move on after college football like and we all uh you know we all wish the best for each other uh, especially when they have the opportunity to play at the next level and uh, we knew that it was going to be a lot of you know uh upcoming guys that were going to be a, a big role on the team and uh so we didn't sit back and worry like oh my god who's next uh all we could think about is who's going to make a big impact on the team let's put these guys on the field and i'm pretty i'm pretty sure the coaches already knew who they wanted to um you know give opportunities to uh who they knew they was going to make a like like i said a huge impact on the, on the field and uh help us win games and uh you know luckily for us we had Stetson been on the offensive side uh so many guys so many offensive weapons and there's so many defensive weapons and, you know, and a lot and a lot may say the last three games wasn't our best games when we pulled through Well, the last two games or the two games before the national championship wasn't our best games. But we pulled through and uh, for the guys who were on the field that worked their butts off and, uh, you know, to make it to where we are now, uh, Jay Bull, Jalen Carter, Zion Logue, uh, um, Melikha Starks as a freshman, you know, me playing nose guard, Darnell Washington, Brock Bowles, of course, you know, guys like Lad McConkey, you know, doing big things and, you know, people like Cedric Van Pran at center, you know, uh, just guys accepting those roles and uh, that just helped us get to where we needed. And that was a national championship and going back to back and, and, and those are 15 guys uh, wasn't something that we dwell doing. So it was more of let's reload instead of re uh stocking just reload. Yeah, and another aspect of that that I think some people don't think about as much because they just think about how great Georgia is is that you were an incredible player coming out of high school. Uh one of the top recruits coming out of Georgia. I think it was like 267 in the nation but you don't just because you have that pedigree and you had that coming in, you had to sit behind guys like Jordan Davis, mm -hmm. Travon Walker who were top picks, but you're still a great player in your own right, where if you went to maybe a smaller school, you start right away and play as a freshman. So mm -hmm. what is it like being a part of such an, crazy talented uh front seven and defensive line and what has that been like having to kind of sit behind them waiting your, for your opportunity to get on the field well you know luckily for me like uh me and like two other guys Jalen Carter and Warren Brinson we all came in the same year that was 2020 and uh we were all you know blessed enough to see the field just a little bit trying to trying to get a taste of how it is to play uh college football in a in a level that we're playing in the SEC you know all I could all I could do was just sit back and you know watch these guys 
grind and bump heads against other teams, good teams, is that uh, winning, helping the team win games and stuff like that. And all, all I couldn't do was just imagine myself on the field, helping out the team and working and busting my butt, and, you know, and going out there and also having fun, learning behind these guys. And, you know what I mean? I love I love that. Uh, Jordan Davis, Trayvon Walker, uh, Devontae, Devontae Wyatt. We had linebackers like uh, Quay Walker, uh, Nicobe Dean, uh, DBs. The DBs like, uh, 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 I can't really think right now. It's a lot of names. But to play with those guys, all I could do was sit back and watch and learn from them. And, you know, as they le- as they led the team, you know, all I could do was just be a sponge and gain information and have fun with these guys. Because I knew that because of the amount of uh, uh, success they brought to the team and the amount of when they brought to the team and the impact they put on the team that eventually they were going to go up to the next level. So all I could do is just prepare myself, callous myself. Like I said before, I was blessed enough to see the field early. So uh, I was more callous into the system early. And, you know, all I could do is just put my head down and just wait my turn. And, you know, and it happened. Uh, last season, I started every single game, and it was fun. Why well, last, and it's going to happen again this year. And that, it also adds a different level. It keeps you guys fresh. I'm assuming being able to rotate Jalen Carter, your, Carter yourself, uh, all, all the all the young guys. I think it because you have all that talent. It allows some guys that may not. I'm not saying this is you, but may not be ready coming in as a freshman yeah, that are still high recruits to get a little bit of playing time to dip their toe toe in b- before they're thrown into the wolves, so to speak. And it's. It's like it's kind of it's kind of somewhat nerve wracking, you know, uh, you know, you go out there and especially in the SEC, you know, some of us can go to Big Ten, Pac-12, you know, some of us go to Sunbelt and play and, and kind of get those butterflies out of our stomach real early. And, you know, just me just me knowing what I was putting myself into, especially playing for the University of Georgia and, and all the past accomplishments that Kirby had coming here. And, you know, you know, me being a freshman, you don't. Been he was only here for like four to five years already. Uh, yeah. He's going on his uh, he's going on his seventh or eighth year as a um you know as a rising senior now he's going on his seventh or eighth year here and, and and to know that I was going to be playing behind uh, a coach who has had history with Nick Saban and and, and, and some experiences in the NFL all I could do is just you know uh, wait for all the the hard work that I was going to be put into and it's, and it's an excitement and you know what I mean to be to be as a, to be a freshman at, on a, on a winning team of, of course my freshman year he didn't really you know, uh, come on top of the SEC championship. We lost against Florida. That was something that a lot of people weren't expecting. Uh, we lost Bama in the regular season. And we ended up playing in Cincinnati in the Chick-fil-A Bowl. Uh, a lot of guys who knew they didn't fulfill their uh, their accomplishments as players on the team, knew they weren't really going to go um, early in the draft, came back that same year. And I still got enough uh, playing time as I thought I should get. And I still developed more as a player and, you know, sat behind sat behind those guys and still, you know, made a big impact on the team, had a couple of shine plays and stuff like that. And it's just exciting to watch those guys just go and win, uh, you know, first national championships since 1980 or 1982, whatever that year was. And it was just great. It was a great experience. And I just knew at that point that we were going to get back in the lab or maybe it had been, maybe it was the celebration uh, parade, but I just knew somewhere around that, that we were, we can do it again and that I was going to be a key player on the team to help do it. So you kind of mentioned that process of kind of trusting in it from the beginning and now a big topic of discussion in college football, something that you've kind of grown up in as far as your college career is the college transfer portal. And we kind of saw that with Texas A&M, they signed all those big names, they had the big recruiting class, and then a bunch of them left like right away. So (laughs) what is, as a player that's actively in college and has kind of seen that maybe some teammates or certainly seen other teams build up their roster or players leave because of it what's your perspective on it did it ever cross your mind in the beginning maybe when you weren't getting those major opportunities right away um not at all like you know the transfer portal is i honestly feel as though it's something that players revert to to try to restart their destiny or restart their uh 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 you know what I mean? Their pathway, you know, because I could easily say, oh, this player is left because they weren't, you know, playing time. They weren't good enough. Maybe they find somewhere where they can uh, fulfill their talent, where they know they can get more playing time. But I'm not going to say that because a lot of times I don't really know a lot of people's, you know, stories. And so when people, when, and we know when guys transfer always, especially when I play, the, I play with them, when guys transfer is like, you know, I always wish them luck to where they go. And uh, it never really came across my mind real. Of course, the thought of, damn, when I'm going to get on the field came across or, and when I'm going to be able to uh, fulfill, you know, my talents to show them that I could really go out there and play in the SEC. Yes, it came across my mind so many times. And but something deep down inside told me just wait, the time is coming, and when it comes, make the best out of it. And you know, I can only appreciate 
you know, Coach Scott, our uh, defensive coach, and Kirby just, you know, giving me that opportunity and just, you know, watching me because they've always been watching. And, you know, when guys transfer, it can be NIL. It can be – sometimes it could be family. Uh, if they're transferring back home, if they're not from the in-state, they could be transferring back home. It's just a lot of things that go on to that. You can't – and it's – can't really be too quick to judge about it. And, you know, all I could do is wish them up, um, wish them luck and wish them well. And hopefully they do whatever they do and become successful wherever they at. And so, yeah, um, I, I wouldn't say it came across my mind at all. Uh, and a lot of I've seen a lot of guys do it. And I can only tell myself, like, wow, these guys have a lot of balls. They have a lot of nuts to do that. Because to do that after a uh, fan base has followed you, it's like, how how would the fan base react when you go against the home team or when you go against a team that's, you know, maybe that's not winning as much? But it's just a lot to say about that. That's, that's it. Yeah, it's, it's definitely interesting how it's shaped the landscape. Because there's, I mean, a couple guys where they go somewhere, coach gets fired, all of a sudden they're locked into uh, their, their scholarship. And then the coach doesn't even want to play them that much. So, I I think I the way I view it I feel like it's been a a net positive overall I think there's certainly some things with the whole NIL where it gets a little you know uh, fishy with (laughs) what goes on behind closed doors (laughs) but you spoke a little bit earlier about the butterflies in your stomach and I I was always wondering it because I've only seen it from my own perspective so I went to NC State I was a sport management major there I had the opportunity to work in their football recruiting department and and in high school I was I also played defensive tackle but you know I'm six foot two six 60, not a six foot three, 320. (laughs) And, you know, I was, I did my thing. I I was, you know, pretty good. I thought I, you know, when you're at that level and you're just competing against other high schoolers and you're not competing against the best every single week, you think you're just, you're good. You think you can play in college. Now, realistically, I probably would play D2 ball, but then because (laughs) of injuries and whatnot, I'm not going to talk about myself too much. But when I, when I was on the field at NC State, I was like, holy shit, these guys are just, a different level of big, a different level of athlete. So I know you are one of those guys, but was there ever, uh, when, maybe when you were a freshman, were you like, holy shit, this is new, like welcome to college football moment. It's kind of like how people talk welcome to the NFL moment. So my welcome to college football moment was against Tennessee, the last three minutes of the game. And you might look up, you might look this up after, after the, the Zoom call, but it was the last three minutes of the game against Tennessee. Uh, I was going against a guard who actually played at Georgia, but transferred to Tennessee. He go by the name, is it Kate Mays? I'm not much, if I'm not mistaken. On that drive, coach put me in. I'm like, we're already winning by like three to four touchdowns. So I'm like, there's no way coach puts me in with three minutes in the game. I'm, he's I'm most likely he's going to let the, the vets play at, play out the game. Now get up, get up. You're going to get in. And Jayna Carter looks at me like, come on, I got to, you got to get ready, man. And I haven't played it in the game till that till that very moment. That's like four to five games in. Yeah. And so I'm like, man, I got to get in. And it's crazy. And so my butterfly is running. The off- offense still has the ball. So offense still has the ball. And eventually they're going to punt it to Tennessee. And so I'm on the side. I'm like, man, like, I'm going to get in. And like, I, you know, so I go in and all I could do is think about, OK, look, you already know the place. You know, you, they're already so consciously embedded in your head. All I do is just go out there and play. And so I go out there. I'm like the butterfly every snap. I'm feeling like, huh, my, 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 my heart is racing every snap on that drive. And then my welcome to college football moment was when I was, the, the ball was passed and I was still like in the grass with Kate Mays and just like threw me on the ground. And I was like, whoa, but that's, a, that's <laughs> man's strength. And I'm still 18. Like I. I think, I, yeah, I'm still 18 at this time. So I'm just yeah. now, I'm fresh out of high school. Like, and so it's like, wow. And so, yeah. And then after that game, there weren't, there weren't no more butterflies. I actually got into a, a more real game against Kentucky. I say like two, maybe, maybe it may have been one or two weeks after that. And uh, we played again, we played in Kentucky. And um, I don't know if you remember, Jordan Davis went down, Julian mm-hmm. Rochester went down. And so coach, our, my um, uh, position coach, coach uh, Trey Scott, looked my way again. He was like, nah, it's, it's, it's your time, man. We're in the first half of the game. So I'm like, wow, like I'm really finna get in. So we played Kentucky, no butterflies. Because like, I already had that welcome to the uh, college football moment weeks prior to that. And I'm like, let's go. Let's go out here and play. And I didn't have my worst game. And and, and, and I, like, I didn't have a bad game at all. And so, you know, I just, um, you know, I uh, appreciate uh, the opportunity that I can, you know, play early. And then uh, that's how I got those butterflies out. So what what about also those first few practices at Georgia going straight from high school where you're going against guys probably half the size of you. Uh, certainly every week you're not going against former four star, five star, even three star recruits. So what what were those first few practices like? So like the, the first few practices I would say will be spring ball. And of course, like they were very like strict in a lot of things because it's like post-COVID. Um, yeah. 
And so, you know, but we were still hitting. Going to practice was, my freshman year going to practice was almost stressful because I knew that most likely I was, after I found out about the logistics of a practice and the dynamics of what they do in practice, I was like, oh, damn. And so every day at the class, I'm like, oh, I got practice, man. And the only reason I would say that is because I was on scout team. To be on the scout team, meaning you're going against the number, the one offense. And at the time, our offense was really good. So we had JT, JT Daniels. Uh, we had uh, Jordan, George Pickens. Guys like George Pickens, uh, Trey Hill at center, Ben Cleveland at guard, uh, Justin Schaefer. All these guys, most of these guys are in the league right now. And so to be a freshman to play up against grown men who are Literally a year into going into NFL, one year into going to NFL, it was nerve wracking. Every day, I'm like, hey, I got, I got to get my mind right because it was almost a game every day because of uh, those those um, scout reps. And when I say Georgia callous me for freshman year, it was that it was the scout team. And since then, all I could do is treat the the uh, our scout team offense. Like, you know what I mean? Like the, like the scout team offense would treat me when I was a freshman. So I was like, okay, I would go out there and, and um, treat our scout team offense accordingly because I used to be a freshman too. And most of these scout team offense alignment are freshmen or underclassmen. So I got to show them like, look, I had to go through it. Now you got to go through it too. And those butterflies, of course, eventually uh, left my stomach, of course, because these are guys that I talk to every day. So you only feel comfortable playing against these guys. And it will only be hard throughout the week because we knew that if it's hard throughout the week, the game is easy. So it's just like that. Yeah, and also with scout team, you're trying to run someone else's op or someone else's defense. Yeah, yeah Alpha's defense, yep. Yes, yeah, so you're not you're not even running your own defense, so then you're trying to replicate someone else and how someone else plays. So I'm sure as a freshman going against guys who they've been running the same offense for the last 3-4 years, that doesn't make yeah. it any easier. Exactly. <laughs> Kind of, I want to talk to also uh, your high school experience a little bit because I think that's something people don't hear about as much because they hear a lot about their college experience and how that went for them as they head into the NFL draft. Oh. So you were, you were a four-star recruit as far as uh, 24-7 had you listed, and I'm sure you had scouts coming to your school weekly. What was that? And I've I've kind of seen that as well because I played with um, Thomas Hannigan who went to App State and Trey Turner who went to Virginia Tech at my high school. Uh -huh. But what was that like as far as the just the experience as a highly recruited high school guy, uh, recruits coming every single week to your games, going okay. out to official visits and stuff like that? You know, high school experience was like I kind of got I kind of got the half experience. You know, I'm like, if you look, if you look now, like the high school recruiting is crazy. Uh, and I have uh, a lot going on. You got big guys, uh, really good guys coming out of high school. And um, in the beginning, I didn't really know too much about college football. They knew too much about the recruiting process. Uh, all I all I can remember is that when I transferred from MLK to Stevenson, or before I transferred to MLK to Stevenson, I had a coach, uh, Tracy Rocker. At the time, he was uh, a coach with Mark Rick, or yeah, Mark Rick at Georgia. I don't know if Kirby was still here, but I'm pretty sure Mark Rick was still here. Uh, Tracy Rocker was the defensive line coach here, and he comes up to my school. This is ninth grade. I'm like 16, 15 years old. He comes up to my school while I'm in class, asks me, I asked me out of class, we got to talk. He was like, yeah, I want to get you over here to Georgia, come visit, this and that, blah, blah. And you're talking to a kid who does not know nothing about recruiting college football at all. All I did was just play football in ninth grade because I enjoyed it. It was fun and it was just something to do. Like and and so I was excited. And um when I got to meet Tracy Rocker, that was a taste of look, this is recruiting. And so I go home, and, you know, like any high school K one, especially when they're getting looked at by a big school like Georgia, I go home and tell my mom, Mom, you would not believe what happened in school today. And so, yeah. you know, I gave her the real spiel about that. And then she was like, Oh my God, I'm excited for you. This and that blah blah blah. After that, uh I had teammates from uh Little League football to, you know, hit me up on social media. Hey, I go to Stevenson. It's in the same county. You should come, you know, look at us. We're really interested in trying to get you here. This and that, blah, blah. I talked to the coaches. I told them I played ball with you. You should come in, you know, play ball with us. This and that, blah, blah, blah. Of course, uh, like any high school player would, especially when you're playing uh, playing on a team that's not as good. And when you hear Stevenson, especially in DeKalb County, was a big thing. This is before Cedar Grove you became. Like right now, you look at DeKalb County, people think about Cedar Grove. This is before before Cedar Grove you became like a big thing. And so, yeah, so I transferred to Stevenson after ninth grade season and uh, they counted me up. And uh, I had to fight for a position, same thing, same way I had to fight for a position here in Georgia. I fought for, for a position there. And uh, luckily for me, luckily for me, like, because a lot of uh, schools don't really have it, and it's unfortunate. But luckily for me, I had a recruiting coach. A uh, recruiting coach, he wasn't nowhere. He, he didn't involve nothing with the football team when it came to plays and working out and stuff like that. He was more of getting these players' names out into colleges because – that's what his job was. He didn't work with the school. All he did was work with recruiting on the team 
possible. And so I was lucky to have a recruiting coach. He got my name out there. Hey, this is kid. He's like six. At the time, oh, I didn't hear my, I didn't even hear like Gross Grossberg, and I wasn't really getting big at the time. But hey, it's this kid at Stevenson's name's not nah, Stackhouse. You should come look at him. This and that, blah, blah blah. Got my name out there. Got my first offer to Memphis. And when I got my first offer to Memphis, it was like wow. And the craziest thing is, most of the colleges that offered me never uh, uh, invited me to visit at all. And so that's that there helped me break down. All right, what colleges I should actually be looking at? Who was actually pulling at me more than anything. And the crazy thing is they started pulling at me more toward the end of my junior year into my senior year. And it's like, wow, like I've been in high school for uh, for th- four years. They started recruiting me around sophomore year. It wouldn't take that so long. So you got, play- you got places like Tennessee, uh, Georgia Tech, Auburn pulling at me. And at this time, Jordan was already showing me love. And I was consistently coming to Georgia, looking at campuses, started hanging out with some of the players. And, and I, I was doing that from sophomore year all the way to senior year. And so I just created a relationship with some of the coaches. And, and you know, most of the coaches that recruited me were here with I got here. And so and that's how you, and, I, and I, of course I did uh, visit other schools like Tennessee, Georgia Tech, Auburn, Alabama, uh, Florida, Florida State. I was visiting these colleges, Clemson, but since sophomore year, high school, Georgia is there the whole way. You know, that's how I broke down my recruiting. So I would say, uh, I feel as though that's how recruiting should go. And uh, you know, at the time there was no NIL at the time. And then plus I didn't, and I didn't know anything about stars either until like in my junior year. They were like, Oh, you're a four star. I'm, like, I'm a four star. Oh, okay. <laughs> I didn't know that. Okay. Thank you. I'm a four star now, I guess. And so, um, before my junior year, my teammate was like, bro, you gotta open up a Twitter. So the coaches could text you and stuff like that. I was like, Twitter, why well, I gotta have a Twitter account? So, like, <laughs> this is a lot going on. And so yeah. that was the peak, almost the peak of recruiting. And it's, you know, I just got a good taste of that and it, and it felt good. So you didn't even have that many social media medias until you got to college, it sounds like. At, at all. Like, not even, I wouldn't even say until I got to college. Like, I, I came here as a freshman with 2,000 followers uh, on IG. <laughs> I didn't, I had a TikTok at the time, but it was like, I guess 400, 500 followers at a time. Yeah, yeah. I would say the only thing was blowing up was my uh, my Twitter. I had like 3,000 to like 4,000 followers on Twitter. And then I guess slowly but surely, my name started to go out there. I started to post more videos on TikTok. I started to get more active on Instagram uh, because I was already active. It's just that no one knew who I was. So they weren't really entwined in what I had to say or what I, what I had to post on Instagram. So I was getting a couple of hundred fo- uh, likes on the. Uh, Instagram. I post a story, probably like 50 to 60 people see it. Not too much. Just I started to see a difference. Uh after I started to get more into the Georgia football thing, started mm-hmm. actually, you know, develop my developing myself socially, uh physically, and you know, Georgia football and stuff like that. People started to see me more. And so, and then when I was um a recruit or as I got here, I started to just, you know, meet different people, uh, express myself around different people, started getting people liking and stuff like that. And that's just how I built my platform. Uh necessarily that's just how I am. That's just how I am as a person. So when I meet someone, I I make a really great connection with them and stuff like that. And then I started to, you know, learn TikTok more, started to look up ways of how I could be a better, I wouldn't say influencer, but more of how I could be a better video maker on TikTok. And so it went from a hobby. No, it went from a joke to a hobby. And so as I started getting bigger on TikTok, it kind of all accumulated from TikTok to Twitter to to, to uh, Instagram. So you if you probably see some of my TikToks on Twitter from uh, me touring Bones area. Like I never knew that was on Twitter until I looked at my mention, and I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, wow, they didn't even know they posted this. They make an yeah. article about it and stuff like that. And so that told me I was like, now nah, you can you can make something out of this. So you can you can you can be an uh, influence on Instagram as well as or more influential on Twitter and also be an influencer on TikTok. And so that's just how I did that. And recruiting helped me. Well, I would say recruiting helped me, but just being uh, just coming from not a lot. You know what I mean? Socially, mm-hmm. because at the time recruiting wasn't big. It wasn't big. They weren't. They weren't making big names of players. They weren't making highlight videos and, and going to uh, OT seven camps and stuff like that. Uh, at the time, it was Nike Open, and the last time we had a Nike actually a real Nike Open, it was twenty twenty or twenty uh, nineteen. I never had it since. So, and uh, it's just been building up since then. Yeah. yeah, all those Nike, all those Nike things have really slowed down. And I want to ask you about uh, social media in a second. But there was something I want to ask you about uh, that you mentioned briefly that I wanted to just catch on to because it's something that has actually been common with the few people I have interviewed. So, do you not play football until your freshman year of high school? Did I get that right? Oh no, um, no. Uh, I play. I started playing football 
I, I started playing football at seven. Oh, okay. Because yeah, it I sounded like it's, you just started playing as a freshman. I was like, no oh, way. No, I, <laughs> luckily for me, I started as a freshman um, at MOK. It wasn't really a, a good team, but because of my size, they put me on the field. Yeah. So when you said started, you meant started on varsity. Yeah, on varsity. There you go. Gotcha, so, gotcha, gotcha. Um, so, yeah, I started at seven years old at Park League. And then, and, you know, I've just been playing since then. And then uh, MOK was my first start as a, a freshman in high school. Gotcha. And also, that recruiting p- piece of it also is like something that I made a mistake since I was definitely like from what I found also working in the recruiting department and then yeah. also reflecting back on my own personal experience where I look, oh, maybe I could have gone and played D2 ball there. Or, oh, like low level D1 ball is like, I didn't go to any camps. I didn't um, send out any tape. And I was like, you know, yeah. if I'm good, they'll just find me. And when I worked in the recruiting department, I, w- I realized how wrong I was. Because if you don't, unless you're like a you or like a high level guy, they're going to have no clue who you are. And there's also some guys, which you find out that are maybe high level recruits but it's really only because of the school they go to or they've been yes. to like 30 camps there you go and so i get that question a lot and you know I have a lot of guys hit me in my dms on twitter snapchat no no on twitter tiktok or instagram and i can all, all i can only be honest with them they were like so like how do i get an offer to georgia i don't know <laughs> i was not on the when i was a sophomore i was down the map but i have no i had no huddle at all uh all, my teammates helped me with huddle like i didn't even know what huddle was my teammates like after freshman year of high school, my teammates, um, so I'm doing, I'm doing a uh, second semester MLK. My teammates are like, hey, you gotta, you gotta upload your highlights from freshman year. And I was like, what's, well, how I do that? What I gotta do? They was like, oh, make a huddle account and stuff like that, blah, blah, blah. And so as I, as I started to get to learn that, I started, you know, looking through film and, and then marking it down and I posted my huddle. I don't know if the coaches was actually going in huddle and looking at players. And so yeah. all I remember, all I can remember is that freshman year, Tracy Walker came to my class. I don't know why he came to my class. They know who he was. I guess. After he, I don't know, he may have been in the area and just stopped by MLK and maybe my coach at the time, Nick Kashama, told him like, oh, I got a defensive lineman here. He's like 6'3", this and that, blah, blah, blah. You should see him. And when Tracy Scott see me, that will put me on the map. That's what put me on the map. And uh, my name has been in through the NCAA recruiting and, and um, I would say the only time I actually hit the uh, 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 rivals or 24-7 was like in the sophomore year middle of my junior year playing schools because when i was at stevenson we played schools like uh uh, uh we played schools like uh grayson we played grayson in the spring game played grayson in the spring game um we played mill creek and these big schools so we go to grayson and mill creek your recruiting is really good in my opinion i don't know if that's true or not but i'm i'm uh i'm pretty sure that your recruiting uh coaches have a lot of resources and stuff like that and so and it's hard to like answer those questions but how you recruit and all i can say it just hit up these coaches. There's never no. It's never uh, too much uh, communication. Get in that DM. Send them. Send get email them. Uh, hit up their uh, recruiting offices. Uh, throw out your because you have to learn how to promote yourself. Because if no one else, if if you can't promote yourself, no one else will. So you gotta learn how to believe in you. You gotta learn how to bet on yourself. Because if I have no people, I have no one looking at me. I'm gonna find a way where I'm gonna get noticed. If it's TikTok, if it's Instagram, Twitter, hitting up people up in the DMs, going to camps because. Throughout my whole high school, I went to, I would say, went to one Bama camp. I had a private, I had a private workout here at Georgia. Never been to a Georgia camp. Uh, I went to an Under Armour camp. They didn't even invite me to the Under Armour game. I went to the Adidas camp. They didn't invite me to the Adidas game. Uh, I, I, all, all I can remember is that I went to an opening camp and they invited me to the opening. Yeah. So, like, those, four, those are four camps. Throughout my whole high school year, there were four camps I went to. And I wouldn't say those camps put me on the map because at the time I was already committed. And yeah. um, that 20, in 2017, I committed at the SEC championship against Auburn. And uh, I wasn't even on the map yet. I just like, you know what? I want to solidify my decision here to kind of, you know, make my recruiting easier. And that's it. Yeah. And of, of course, it's a little different also just because I had the level of recruit you were. But like just to speak speak to the like whole market yourself, put yourself out there. That's 100 percent of, of what it is, because if you look at it objectively and take a step back as someone who is maybe just a fan of the sport, how do you like no one's going to notice you or uh, t- uh, take notice of your highlights unless they're specifically looking up your name or if they know your high school football coach, they maybe yeah. know your recruiting coach like you, yeah. you were lucky enough to have in high school. So unless you go to a camp.
camp or you're lucky enough to maybe be playing against someone who's already recognized as a high level recruit and a coach goes to your game, there's no way they're going to find you. Now, connecting that a little bit to the social media side of things, I wanted to ask you um, what that has been like for you as you've kind of gone through that learning process because it seems like your content has only improved. You know, you've changed the formats that you've gone through on your TikTok and you've posted different types of content. And it's something that myself and Isaiah, as we've gone through with our own content, our like original videos were so bad. Like on right? YouTube. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like we we have all of our original podcasts um privated. We didn't know how to talk really to each other and also to a <laughs> camera and to a microphone. It it's just it's just embarrassing. And then you slowly go through that process and learn how to make that work. Yeah. So what was kind of that learning process for you as far as your content goes? Then the learning process was fun. You know, it was it was fun and it was uh the experience is uh, appreciative, you know. Cause like I said before, it, it started as just a joke. I was like, I seen the video and and then at the time I was at the uh USA uh All American Bowl where we play like uh Venezuela and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So we're in we're in Dallas, Texas in a hotel. And I was like, for it, man. Like, and I'm on TikTok. I'm like, and at the time, at the time it was musically, you know, I was like, musically is lame. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want to use no musically, but I kept seeing t uh, the teammates who I was playing with at the time uh, laughing at videos. I'm like, what is this? They're like, oh, this TikTok, but this video is so funny. You got to watch it. So I, I oh, downloaded the app. And I was like, oh, this is a funny video. I can make a video like that. It's easy. And so at the time, I had an Android. And you know how people you are when you, you, know, yeah. you have an Android. <laughs> and so I was like, you know what? F it. I'll I, I make a video. So I make a video. And, you know, you might do it when you get off of here, but. Uh, it's a video I was scrolling all the way down. It was a scene from uh, 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 some some scary movie. It was, uh, well, it was a parody. It was a parody scary movie. And I made it. I was like, you know, I made it. And I looked at it and I enjoyed it. <laughs> so, and, we, and I made it. And I made a TikTok with a coach. Uh, one of the coaches there, I made a TikTok with him. And I was like, I enjoyed it. And of course, the quality is bad. That's just how it is. You got to start somewhere. Yeah, yeah. And so, but I wasn't really too worried about that. All I can, all I can say, can say is that I enjoyed my content. And to see my videos like that um, at the time, it just made me laugh, made me smile. So I was like, you know, I'm going to keep this up. I like it. It's funny. I don't care if it doesn't get no views or likes. I think it's funny. I'm going to keep it. And so, yeah, I don't know. And it only grew from there when I got here in college. Uh, when I got here in college, my team was like, nah, I gotta get an iPhone. I'm like, no, I don't need an iPhone. I could do my content on here. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I agree with them now that I look back at it. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I, I, I appreciate them forcing me to get an iPhone when I was here. Because yeah. The content did change over time. And I started to, I started to uh, express myself with ideas. And, and had, like, I see, I still even got more ideas. And I'm just so, like, uh, anxious. I want to say anxious, but so eager to start. But it's just because it's so overwhelming. I'm so overwhelmed with ideas. I don't know where to start. I got, I got a GoPro. I want to do stuff with my GoPro. I want to get a mic and do some stuff with the, with the mic and stuff like that. I even got a tripod. I got a, I got a Bluetooth tripod, the one that you carry around, a stable one. I got those. And there's yeah. just so many ideas that I accumulate over time. And 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 I'm pretty sure like people are like waiting on better videos and stuff like that. Because of course you see the algorithm that some videos may get more views than others, but that's okay. It's just it's social media. It's how it is. And so like the development over time is just. It's just the process. I always appreciate the process. And it started from a, it started from just a joke. Now it's a hobby. And it may even be a career. We never know. It may be part of my career. And so I'm like, you got people like Juju Smith Schuster in the league making TikTok and stuff like that. And he's one of the well-known influencers on TikTok. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying I'm gonna be dancing on TikTok, but I can make I can make some I can make some relatable content that people will watch, especially from yeah. an uh, NFL uh, uh, standpoint and right now NCAA standpoint. And then you got you got players in college. I know a guy from Michigan at 400 k on. Uh, uh, TikTok. Uh, Matthew Bowler, he runs here. He has almost a million on TikTok. Mm -hmm. These guys are influencers. These guys are people uh, kids look up to. They like their videos and stuff like that. So I want to make some impact uh, social media wise. And I feel like it's going to open up doors for other things. But you know, right now, I'm just like, I'm still learning and uh, we'll see what else I can uh, make impact on. Maybe YouTube. So I've seen uh, you did that skit recently with the horses. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> as far as like doing different stuff. Yeah. And uh, something I was wondering is because like I completely like have nerded out on viewer retention or also just how to get people to watch more because as someone you know I'll say for ourselves me and me and Isaiah started off as nobody so to speak like we didn't have a we didn't have anyone who really wanted to listen to us we post those horrible few podcasts on early <laughs> on YouTube that <laughs> no one listens you know maybe a hundred people checked it out when we first posted it but it was awful <laughs> eventually we got started on TikTok and you post videos and I go through that process but then like I 
really took a, a look at how to edit the videos in order to get people's attention right away. So as far as your content goes, has there any, have you gone through that process where you're like, man, how do I get people to actually watch for another 30 seconds or 20 seconds or watch the whole thing rather than just scro keep scrolling on the For You page? Actually, I did. Um, it's this thing called Influencer. It's an app called Influencer and it actually mm -hmm. work with uh, NCAA or just athletes who are also on social media as well. Uh, I say about around this time last year, uh, I got on a call, a Zoom call with some of the uh, uh, employees who work at, who work with Zoom. Some of them are interns. And so they broke down the logistics of how to build your content, how to build your platform using TikTok and this and that, blah, blah, blah. Use us as a resource. We'll send you things if you need to, resources like this and that. And so that helped me with uh, the algorithm thing. This is what I learned from the Zoom. The algorithm thing, when people be like, when people hashtag for you page and stuff like that, your your video is already, you want to get your videos to an audience where you know that people will watch. And like you said before, and so I learned that and I was like, oh, the whole time I'll put for you page this, for you page that, FIP this, all that stuff. And so if, I don't know if you've seen it, but every time I post something that can be relatable to a certain category or to a certain community of people, I would hashtag it. So like with the Horse, mm -hmm. I hashtag horse talk, I hashtag equestrian, I hashtag UGA equestrian, I hashtag UGA. Maybe some of the students may see it. And of course, like like I said before, most video more videos blow up uh, more than others. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. And, and it has nothing to do. People always think, and I will ask myself these questions like, do I post early in the day or what time do I post specifically? I will see videos of like, oh, if you post at this time, you're bound to hit 100K views and this and that, blah, blah, blah. And TikTok, TikTok broke it down to me. I was like, look, this is not, this is all false. This is not, it's, it's just people so they can get views on their, uh, on their videos. And you were a victim of one of those, one of those views. And so that was like, look, just be, this just be you be more creative with your videos if you want to reach a certain uh community of people this is what you do and so i learned and so i would use tiktok her name is been saying at a time and she was helping me and she would literally made a whole uh case study about my growth on uh tiktok and if you see a couple videos i saw my videos like blow up like mm -hmm. 200k views 400k views i mean i got like four to five videos that hit a million views 20 20k likes stuff like that and so she literally broke down my growth of likes and views Views and stuff like that due to the amount or due to me hitting certain um communities of people and so uh so she would tell me like look just keep doing you this and that blah blah and it's another thing that she and that i still i still i took away from that whole zoom and i still uh keep to myself this day is that not keep to myself but hold to myself this day is that she said the amount of seconds into a video is very very important she was like you want to you want to gain that attention for the first i say 10 or 15 seconds into the video she was like people average people average uh 10 to 15 seconds before they before they scroll to the next video she said within those 10 to 15 seconds if your video is not uh intriguing or or or, or yep. getting someone's or getting someone's thoughts like oh yeah i like this you know what i mean then they're just gonna keep scrolling and so I always think that to myself. So uh, Ben, the horse, I was like, you know what? What about actually have been in one of my videos? Maybe I could gain a couple of uh, horse talk followers. And I actually did. I got like 10K people who I got like 10K people who are actually horse lovers. And stuff like that. <laughs> Follow me on Instagram. And it was just a it was just a really great experience. So when I do post videos of a horse, some uh, of the horse, if it's not consistent, then they won't watch it over and over again. And so I was like, you know what? If I start a skit, maybe I could do another skit. But we got to work on it because I would say that 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 is not my best work and there's been videos where i've recorded for 24 or 48 hours and then edited for like 30 minutes and it blew up on tiktok and so i yeah. feel like those videos that i actually put a little bit more effort to blow up and and so it was some videos where it blew up and it, it didn't blow up but i put so much work into it and but all i can do is appreciate the amount of work that i put to, into it because at least i know that okay you have the you have the potential and so Eventually, I'm gonna learn how to edit videos on on Adobe and stuff like that mm -hmm. to to get more viewers and stuff like that. But you know, right now I'm just uh, I'm just doing what I can, doing what I know. Well, that's that's a major thing. What you hit on the first 10 to 15 seconds, because you know I'm on the we're on the sports commentary side of things. So also we see you know guys like that come up on our for you page who have much smaller followings, and I'm just like I see we're also some people that maybe make content more like you or you do more skits, so to speak, where you you throw some more in between as far as commentary stuff but it's like 
no one's really going to care that much if in the first five seconds you don't really say anything or if there's not something visually that grabs their attention. So something like that we've done for uh, the past few months is like our first 10 to 15 seconds, we throw in um, text on the screen as far as what we're saying, because if you throw that text on the screen, it engages their brain. Oh, what are they actually saying in it? Yeah. Maybe if they, they read it, then they're thinking about what we're saying. And then when it goes to no text, they'll be listening instead of just reading it. It. So yeah. it's like my my brain goes into like that and then also oh, I'm saying this there, something has to visually represent it here. Mm-hmm. And it's like this whole thing where I'm thinking about like each thing. And then there's just people who don't think about that. And they maybe just throw a TikTok up there. And, it, and they're like, why did I only get 500 views? And I'm like, <laughs> well, your video sucks. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's so like another thing, you know, Ms. Zang always told me, she said, she was like, there are a community of people who have autism, the community of people who are blind and community of people who are deaf. And so she was like, you want to make, your videos are more accessible mm-hmm. um, to these communities. And what she mean by that is, whenever you post a video, have that title up there. Uh, and, it's, and you know that most of my videos have a little black title or yep. a saying like POV this or or this is a you know, video about this or something like that. And she's like, have that title up there so you can so they can at least read what the video could possibly be about. And another thing is some people may misinterpret what you're saying in your video. So why not put a closed caption at the bottom when you're when you're uh, detailing every word that you said, because some people's slangs may be different than others. Uh, I might say a word that you say differently. And so to put in the captions, they can understand. So while they're watching the video, they can read the captions as well. I didn't know what it, what do you mean when he said this word? I don't know what he meant when that word, but there is, is, if it's in the captions, then they can break it down just like that. And and this is said, I would be there. Oh, she even, she even got me a mic. She got me a yeah. mic. And so my videos weren't more like, you know me, echoey. I could, I could, I got to talk up to the mic and you can hear what I'm saying. You can hear, you know, we can hear the dynamics of what I'm saying, stuff like that, you know? It's yeah. Easy. yeah that, that's that's a whole big part of it. It's now that I've also talked to you more, I know a lot of your stuff is skits. Uh, first of all, what's maybe your major? I don't know what your college major is. I don't know if it's communications, broadcasting, but you're great at talking. Are you going to do any more of that type of content, maybe on your oh, YouTube channel oh, or no, TikTok? Def- definitely. So I don't know. I don't know where I start, but eventually I'm going to find out. Unfortunately, I'm not uh con major anymore i was um mm-hmm. I, I say towards the end of my sophomore year i didn't really like the classes for real i didn't know where i was going with so they insisted that i switch majors and i was like you know what i'll try housing management maybe mm-hmm. i'll just do that and get a degree in that but and actually i wanted to do other things so and i started to tell myself like look like you know what i mean you, you you're possibly you could be possibly building yourself a social media platform or mm-hmm. um, or uh, what's that word i'm looking for a portfolio of yourself on social media so why not get into sport broadcasting i feel like my mom said she was like you can be good at talking and uh this and that blah blah, blah. and I, w- I just took that i just took that and ran with it and i was like you know what i i, I could do that and those skits that i not skits but those those uh um day in the lives and stuff like that and and me putting like the the commentary and stuff in it i wrote that down <laughs> all of yeah. that wrote down that was never just winged out and just oh yeah it isn't that blah blah no, everything was actually wrote down. And so, and I looked at it and read it. Every No one knows that, but I'll lie. This, this is how it, it's just how it helps me when it comes to uh, commentating my videos. I wrote down every single word and, and some, and, and some, you don't know if I didn't write it down because I was stuttered. I stutter yeah. a lot whenever I talk, especially if there's no one to talk to like yourself or if it's in front of a big group of people, I always stumble over my words. And so, and so what helped me thoroughly go through my commentating was just by writing it down, almost like a skit. And so, I wrote it down and so some videos may seem funny when i'm talking i may put a joke uh or two in there and stuff like that and so yeah um when i started doing all that i started breaking down what i really wanted to do after football and that was sports broadcasting being on tv sec network maybe esp yeah something about talking because i know they have a prompter that has every word that they want to say and i connected with guys like gary streisky and uh people who work for sec uh no a sports center i met these guys who the orange bowl we played michigan and you know and and, and gary and gary was like uh, i eventually me and him are eventually going to do something intern uh and mm-hmm. sports center and, and so once i found out that these people have prompters when they talk and stuff like that i was like <laughs> I could probably write up. I could probably write up some humorous things and 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 have it aired on on live television. And I'm pretty sure that I can make a living out of it. So I was like, yeah. And I like football. I like sports. So why not after football stay within the sport and in, in the community? Yeah, and that's what you said to um also writing it down. Like that's such a big thing that I don't think people 
really even think about that much. And something I want to ask you, were you always good at talking or also always confident when you were speaking? Because I know for myself, when I started doing these podcasts and TikToks and stuff, and I was writing down a script, I was not good at just, or as good as I am now, at just having a conversation with you or having a back and forth and doing an interview because I hadn't written out my thoughts. And when your thoughts, or at least for me, when my thoughts are just coming in my brain, I'm like, oh, what do, do I say this here? Or do I interject here? So has that process also maybe just in present uh, presenting in class or uh, maybe even in person, has that process of writing down everything helped you just talking to people in general? Yeah, that the writing down thing, it all starts from just me being a kid and just having a really good core of writing. Like we all have our strengths when it comes to subjects mm-hmm. in school. And so language arts and writing and reading was my strengths. You know, like most people, especially in big crowds, um, our thoughts move faster than our mouths or is it our mouth? Our mouths move faster than our thoughts. And so, yes, I had a, a really big problem with that. Of course, when it came to talking about subjects and you see me and you were having a me and you were having a really good conversation. We were, we're we're getting our thoughts out immediately and not stumbling over our words. And we're easily it's easy for us to think about it. But when it's four to five different people or I say hundreds of people, it's like wow, like you know what I mean? It's hard to like gain those thoughts. Is because because we're our heart is racing and, and it's hard for us to breathe and stuff like that. And so I learned to cope with that because there's nothing's changed since. <laughs> and so yeah. and nothing's changed. And so okay, you know what? I know that when I start talking my heart starts to race. So slow down your thoughts, slow down what mm-hmm. you're saying. It's, it's easy for people to listen when you slow it down. And so, you know, that process into just writing as a kid and also speaking, because so there's been some times where I've spoken to classmates. I took public speaking, of course. There's been times where like I had presentations in classes and stuff like that. And the only way you can make a good grade is by having a good presentation. And there's been yep. times where I've been a part of groups where I would do all the work and then they would point at me like, you want to talk? And it was like, wow, like, and to have that thought and you're feeling that, oh my God, I'm going to go from the cloud, I don't want to mess up. Like, and you you know your heart is going to race. I'm anticipating that it is. So I might as well just, okay, hey, my name is Nod. This is our, this and that, so and so. And if I mess up, and if I mess up, make a joke out of it. Like, I'm sorry, guy. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's yeah. stuff like that. And so it helped me just to write it down, just to look at it and like, okay. This is what I want to say. This is what I want to say. Bet. So I'm going to say this first and I'll scribble it out. Oh, no, I don't want to say that. Or and especially if it's talking about something that's very serious when it comes to, you know, topics that is hard, topics that are hard to talk about, especially in a group setting. So let's say uh, uh, um, the LGBTQ community is hard to talk about stuff like that. Religion, uh, 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 um, uh, politics. It's hard to talk about stuff like that. Yeah. So when you bring up those topics, um, you know, I have taught myself to break it down in ways where it's not offensive to people. I've known what to say in certain situations, especially when it comes to uh, presenting in classes or if I need a, a project done or as far as or not, or it can be more as just voice uh, voicing over um, TikToks. And so after I learned how to do that, it's just I just ran with it and it's and it's fun. And like to talk to you now, you would not see this if I was talking to thousands of people. <laughs> and, and, so, and so, like I said, I'm still I'm still coping with that. I'm still learning myself, especially when it comes to just being who I am and just being myself and, and learning how to talk to a uh, lot of people or just on TikTok and by itself. So. Honestly, it's it's blowing me away, like how much I can relate to you and how similar I feel like we are in some level, at least from my first conversation with you, because yeah. I had a very similar perspective as far as like presenting in front of class. You know, I was also the one who I felt like did a lot of the work sometimes in a group project. And when it comes to that presentation, it's like no one else is going to do it for me. And I used to get super nervous. But at a certain point, I was just like, I need to get this done. Like you said, if you mess up, it, why be nervous about messing up? when that's just going to, it's just going to screw you over more if you get right. nervous about yeah, that nervous. mess up. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you just, you like need to write out what you want to say. If you know what you're going to say and you're confident in what you're going to say, then it allows you to speak and have that more productive conversation, have that more productive presentation. And do you think uh, what your, your accomplishments on the football field and all that, and also maybe just playing football in general, do you think that's added to your confidence in conversations or other aspects of your life? I honestly feel, I, I feel like, yeah. Yeah, because they put me on SEC now when we were playing Ohio State. Yeah. And when I say I was so nervous to get up there, <laughs> because they, they didn't inform me uh, the morning. they knew we, I knew we had media the day uh, the day before. But they yeah. informed me that I was going to get on SEC now with Tim Tebow and, and, and Ben Watson and those guys. And so I'm like, uh. and so when they said, Nas, we need you up here at the podium, I'm like, what podium? I thought that I had a podium to myself. People ask me <laughs> No, I'm talking about the podium where you're going to be on live television and you're sitting at Tim Tebow and all these guys got mics. 
they mic you up and stuff like that. I'm like, what the, what is going on? <laughs> and, so, and, I'm, and I'm like, and I'm like, uh, I'm guessing, I'm guessing this is my time to shine because I know this is what I want to do when I, after yeah. football, after football. And so I was like, you know what? F it, we're going to go out there and show these guys that I know how to speak and run it, this and that, blah, blah, blah. And yeah. so we asked me questions that I'm talking about questions where you think that he, he was like, wow, how do, how do I even, you know what I mean? How do I even work around that question? I don't even know what dynamics I should even get into. And so, uh, yeah. And so the confidence in, in, in Tim Tebow, he told me, he was like, yeah, man, I've been watching you for, since, you know, freshman year, you know, playing behind Jordan Davis and these guys, this and that, blah, blah, blah. How have you uh, managed to develop yourself as a player playing behind these guys and stuff like that? Man, I threw out words. I'm talking about, I'm talking like I've already been up there already. So, and, 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 and it only gained, only gained confidence as I was up there. And so, yes, and, and the only reason why is because I knew the amount of work that I put in before that. And yeah. when he said, I've been watching you since freshman year, I'm like, wow, like, that's crazy. Like, and to uh, hear that coming from someone who's a, a, a college Hall of Famer, like, you know, been watching and Tim Tebow and, and, uh, and just to listen to that, listen to him say that, I was like, wow, man. So he, he, he kind of he kind of has a, a idea of who I am, so why not show him? So and, and it's just the confidence just builds up, it builds up from there. Have you ever? Now you mentioned Tim Tebow. I'm sure you've also met a lot of other cool players. Maybe I don't know if you met any celebrities. Have you ever been starstruck at any certain point as you've you know at Georgia with di- maybe different people that you've met? And has that also declined as you've met more cool people? The only I feel like the only person I was actually starstruck to be a person was Quavo when he came yeah. to our game. Yeah. And like, was it like 20? No, 2021, he came to our game against Tennessee or it may have been Tennessee or Auburn. One of those games was a big game. And he came to that game and, you know, Kirby's doing his little pregame uh, speech before we go out there uh, for the intro. And I looked to my right. Quavo's sitting right next to me. I'm like, yeah, I'm trying to listen to Kirby talk too because it's a serious game. He can't go into this game. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm trying to, I'm trying to listen to Kirby talk but at the same time, I'm still trying to like gain in my thoughts that Clayville was literally standing next to me. Like I listened to this man's music, and I was starstruck. But then I had to realize like he's a human. He's a human, just like I'm human. Might as well just. And so since then, all the games he has come to, all the games he came to after that, it was like, oh, what's up, Clayville? It's like a regular person. So to be to be sitting next to Tim Tebow, like I told you in the beginning of the podcast, like I didn't watch college football. I didn't know nothing about college football. Mm-hmm. So, but I know who Tim Tebow was. And so when I was sitting next to him, of course, I was a fan for like five seconds. And then I had to like lock in, like, look, we're finna do this. We're finna do this. Uh, yeah. This, uh, this little SEC Now interview, lock in, and then maybe take a picture with it afterwards. And so that's exactly what happened. What was your first intro? When did you first meet Kirby Smart? Was uh, When was his first visit with you? What's the relationship like? Or what has your relationship like been with him uh, through college uh, as a support system? And... Uh, as far also maybe your position coach what's your, what's your relationship like with your coaches so my relationship with my coaches are very like i would say we're very like understandable if that makes sense we're i wouldn't mm-hmm. say we're entwined like this but my coaches understand me i know what i know what their job is and they know what i'm trying to get to and so they're only going to help me try to get to where i want to be and so i wouldn't say uh as a recruit kirby loved me because i was always up here in athens hanging out coming to see the practices i even had a couple of private workouts like i uh, mentioned before uh the crazy thing is i've been here i've never been in his house i've had a lot of players been in the house i've never been there well i've been to it but i've never been inside like it was like a tent outside where we like ate something like that but I've never been inside uh, our relationship is uh i would say something like Mm-hmm. Uh, Jordan Davis ish. So like, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? So, you know, he, he loved JD when he was here and, uh, you know, while I'm here, he appreciate my, um, you know, just me being patient and to get on the field and, and, and uh, and putting a lot of work into being where I am now. And uh, I would say my relationship is, uh, that relationship is as strong as me and Trey Scott when I was a recruit. I appreciate my loyalty when I was committed in 2017 and signing in 20, 2019, uh, December, uh, early, signing early in 2019 in December. And, mm-hmm. you know, just getting here and making a big ha- impact on the team. It just shows my appreciation to them and it, and uh, show a lot of pre- uh, they show a lot of pre- uh, appreciation to me. So, so I'm, I'm, I apologize. I haven't looked this up fact beforehand, but have you been for either national championship? Have you been to the White House yet? Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a trend that's going on right now. College football world. That is 100 percent a trend. And the uh, craziest thing is me and um, I would say me and Warren, but me and some other guys mentioned that before. And so I took it upon myself to this is confidential, but you're going to post it. I don't care if you post it. But I took it upon myself to uh, text Kirby. 
And this is before the Warren Brinson thing going. This is literally a year before that even happens. And so I'm like, so like Coach Dewey, no, this is this is not before. This is like uh, a couple of months before we even got to the SEC championship. And so I'm like, so Coach, like, do we like, no, 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 this is after the natty. This is definitely after the natty. This is like a couple of months before he tweeted that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I was like, so Kirk, like, do you go see the president? Do we go to White House or what? He says, no, nah, um, I don't think that's a bad idea. Do you think some of the guys would want to? And I was like, well, I'll put it in the chat. You know, some of the guys are intriguing. They're intrigued to go. So we yeah. just want to make it a thing. And we never, and after that, he never responded from then. So I was like, it was a thought in his head already. And I guess, you know, it came across Warren's mind and he actually made moves on it and put it on Twitter. Yeah. And of course he did, probably didn't think that it would blow up. But <laughs> at, the same time, at the same time, he probably did think it was going to blow up. And I'm like, oh yeah, we all remember talking about this a, a year ago, literally. Yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, Warren made it upon himself to put it on social media. And honestly, I feel as though the, the presidency didn't have no choice but to invite the Georgia Bulldogs, especially going back to back. They yeah. had no choice but to invite us to the White House. And so, you know, it's going to be a trip made on a no win, but eventually we're going to be up there and you will definitely see a TikTok video of me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah you got that's that's one you have to take advantage of you how are you gonna feel though if you get the clemson treatment and get a buffet of mcdonald's man i don't know like <laughs> i just feel as though like to be in to be in that uh vicinity to be in that like environment would just be appreciative to me no matter if they gave us steak and steak and shrimp they can give us mcdonald's popeye whatever just to be in the Ohio by itself should be a privilege it yeah be, you know what i mean it would it would be crazy if they said oh let's take them to the white house and they take us to the smithsonian like no i want to go to the white house i don't want to go to the smithsonian i've been here before i want to go to the white house so <laughs> that's no different than that's that's no different than them giving us mcdonald's over it's no different than giving them getting with McDonald's over steak and shrimp. So he gives us McDonald's, then I'm just going to be snacking on some uh, <laughs> some uh, uh, McGriddles or whatever, chicken sandwiches, whatever you want to call it. This is a question I have from Isaiah, who I run this channel with, I run this podcast. How much child support did you have to pay to the mothers of TCU's garden centers after that game? Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> What, what was what was that experience like? Did, so maybe to I don't I don't want to make an answer it like that. But what was that like? Just blowing them, you know, having this uh, the gap and score be what what it was. Before I say anything, one thing I can't say is that they got a really talented team. Um, it well, to be in the like, national championship, yeah, you have to be yeah, good on some yeah, level. They got a really talented team, and it may not and it may have not looked like that on the field. But those guys, they played. They played it hard out all the way to that point. They definitely played it hard out. They deserve to be on that platform. I don't care what no one says. Oh, we should have got Michigan and Georgia or Ohio State and Georgia should have been. I don't care what no one says. Those guys are really good. But in actually, 65 to 7 doesn't really explain, oh, this is a good team. But at the same time, someone had to lose and we just refused to be that team. And so, um, like, on a, that drive where they scored their first touchdown, I wouldn't say that I had a thought in my mind that, oh, we may lose this game. No, yeah. because uh, throughout the Throughout the first half, it was hard for them to pass the 50. All I can say is that we just play harder than them. That's all. They're a very talented team. And the real the real national championship was Ohio State in Georgia and the, uh, and the Chick-fil-A Bowl. But, uh, <laughs> but it was an exciting game to be in SoFi Stadium. Like, all those people there. And it was majority TCU fans. And, and you know, all I could all I could think of, can think about is, like, how can we shut these fans up? Because they really have really deep fan core and we need to shut them up early and after the first half we were like okay we got them we definitely got them we got them, we got them where we need them. yeah speaking speaking of that game what was the feeling in your gut and in your stomach uh when they're stepping onto the field for that field goal to potentially win honestly i had no bad feeling in my stomach at all like no heart rush like because if i honestly thought we were gonna block the kick i'm like we're gonna block the kick all night long <laughs> All night long, they were allowing us. I don't know if you paid attention to the game, like average paid attention to the not not just I know you paid attention to the game, but the field goals and the extra points, we had gaps open the whole way. Like and, mm-hmm. and our coach and our coaches came up to us at halftime when we were down. Well, we were up actually. When we were up and um and they were saying, Hey, they were going up to guys like Darius. He's a freshman, he was a freshman at the time. And he was like, Um, Darius, you need to like hit this gap. This opened up every time we if there's an extra point, hit that gap and let it keep doing it. And eventually it opened up again on the very last field goal. And he didn't hit it, of course, but that would have been a great opportunity to buy the field goal. And he had impacted that play. And unfortunately he missed the field goal. But at the same time, we came from a, a three touchdown deficit. And because of the quarterback they had, so yeah, uh, they had, because of the quarterback they had CJ Stroud, 
they had Georgia's losing 100 percent that game. And so because we're a four quarter team, we had to prove that, look, we could be a four quarter team, regardless if he made the field goal or not. We still came back. So but unfortunately, he missed it. And that's just how it is. And on the game, you, you got the players that can uh, play on the pressure and you got players who can't. So. Yeah, and as a fan and as a spectator, when I was watching a game, I was shocked at the end that they didn't try and make it a closer field goal because they did have the opportunity to do that. Were you guys thinking the same thing that you were surprised we were, they decided to take it from that far back? Yeah, we were expecting it. Because, all right. We were expecting them to actually run another play act on offense. But after that breakup with – after that, after Keely Ringer broke up that slant, Kirby was debating whether they was going to bring their field goal block out or try and get a first down and try to get a closer field goal. They didn't do it, so the, it made the field goal – what, was it 45 yards or something like that? I want to say – it was 45 yards? or 47, I want to say. That's a long way. And it's a long way. In the, it's really, not a gimme in the NFL it's not, either. It's not a gimme at all. And so, like, if you're not that guy, then a 45-yard field goal is very long. You just try and get a little bit more yardage. And because it was like, what, five seconds maybe? It was five seconds in the game. Then yeah. they were like, yeah, you know what? We're going to try to go for a field goal because of how far our defense came from that game. Then I honestly feel though they didn't have that confidence to, like, you know what, let's try to get it first down and make it closer. Or they didn't have that confidence because we're a situational game. I honestly feel as though, honestly feel as though that we practice situation football better than a lot of schools in the nation because if they would have came out in their offense with five seconds on the board, oh, geez, we knew that we would have to keep them in bounds. So they can, so we can keep the clock going. Yeah, and that's a situational, that's a situational game. Coach would probably would have put out dime rabbits, where it's more DBs and less uh, uh deep, defensive linemen, and there would have been a, a time where they probably would have caught the ball or probably try to like get on the ground and get it closer. But that's not enough because uh, the clock starts. Once the clock starts, it's going to three seconds is going to run off after two seconds it ran off. So you hit the ground for yeah. one second. Uh, you hit the ground, you may have not more, you know, and have time at all. Or you catch a slant, or not even catch a slant, catch an out route. You gotta hurry and get out of bounds. Like if, if you don't get the first down, yeah. if you don't get that first down, that clock is not stopping if you hit that ground. So I could be wrong. Didn't they take a knee though, even to line up the field goal? I don't I don't know. I actually don't know. No, no, no way they took a knee. The clock would have kept going. It yeah. was a broken up pass. It was a broken up pass. And I honestly feel as though where they was lined up on a the field they didn't want to be. They were on the left hash. They're on the left mm-hmm. hash, and the field goal is like right there on a the, like a little bit to the right. I don't think they wanted to be there. I honestly feel as though they wanted to be in the middle of the field where it was a line. It would have been an easy kick for them, but of course he chipped it left and uh, made the game. Yeah, I I don't remember the exact circumstance. I don't know if they decided to run the ball because they moved it pretty well, and then then that wound up happening, and then it felt like they kind of just stalled out and went for a long field goal. But you you played against C.J. Stroud. You played against Bryce Young. I don't know exactly who you may have played against in high school, but. Who is the best quarterback you feel like you've played against? And of course, no slight to CJ or Bryce because both are phenomenal players. Both can be top 10 picks. But who is the hardest for you personally to play against? Maybe just how they navigated the pocket, how they rolled out. Who is uh, your the hardest guy you had to play against? Maybe not even the best. I would say whew, it has to be between um, – it has to be – because I didn't play against Bryce Young. Um Oh, I, had okay. a, I had a, a minor injury in the Natty where we played uh, when we first played Bama. And uh, so I had a minor injury, so I didn't get in that game. But if I did, it probably would have to either be between Bryce Young and uh, CJ Stroud. Okay. It would so have to been between those two guys. Yeah. And what was that? Because I think myself, at least as a fan and, and from an outsider perspective, you know, looking at CJ Stroud over the course of his career, he didn't necessarily move the pocket as much. Yeah or run down the field. And then against you guys, all of a sudden we find out he can run the ball. So what was there any halftime adjustment? Was there any like a little bit of um like a little bit of shock that he was running the ball as much as he did? I wouldn't even say it was a shock. Uh defensive wise, defensive line wise, we knew that he can use his legs. We knew that this guy wasn't just a pocket passer. We know that man is mobile. And and I wasn't even saying it was a shock throughout the whole defense. We knew that eventually this man was going to run the ball. He has legs to run the ball. And we also knew that he had a, a little injury too as well. And so it was like, uh, let's get this guy down. Let's collapse the pocket and let's create a trap because we don't want this guy running out of the pocket because of the weapons that he has on the outside as uh, receiving wise. And so it, obviously you see that game, he almost, I don't know if he threw 400 yards or, or whatever, but he, he had a really good game in the air, had a decent game on the ground with his legs. Because their running backs were not doing anything that whole game. Their running backs weren't able to do anything that whole game. So, of course, CJ took it upon himself to let's you know let me use my legs, let me try and be a hero for the team, and that's exactly what he did. 
he got them within the vicinity of a of a, a decent field goal to make. Unfortunately, they didn't come across that field goal and make it, but he still got the, those guys within that field goal. And so uh, it wasn't it was a shot at that time at that moment because the whole game if he if he did scramble it was like five yards six yards maybe yeah but that one scramble was like thirty five to forty yards downfield and uh, our trap wasn't our best trap and you know all our DBs were playing man at the time so no one was there to you know uh, help clean up uh, CJ before he made the first down or just get. Into- a uh, field goal range. So how did so? Uh, I think a big turning point in that game was when Marvin Harrison Jr. went down. Did your guys' game plan change at all once he got injured and was off the field, or uh, did your mentality switch at all once he was off the field? I wouldn't know. I don't think our game plan changed at all because even though Marvin Harrison was down, they still had really decent receivers, and so all he was just uh, thinking is that our DBs, and no, our rush game has to get better because our DBs can't cover for four, five or six seconds. It's hard for them, and and I would say that CJ did a good job of uh, moderately throughout the pocket because not every and not every play was him rolling out and trying to get downfield. It was him just being patient in the pocket and just moving around. I missed the sack just because he stepped up two, two yards. Yeah. That's all it was. And so, and I didn't beat myself up, but I'm like, nah, that's a great, that's a great play. Like he, he stepped up, he used my momentum against me. And so that's, that's, that's literally, so I wouldn't say we, we try to switch on my defense because one receiver went down, we just had to still play a uh, uh, pass rush. Because mm-hmm. at the end of the day, that was a seven on seven game, and we had to develop our pass rush. And unfortunately, I'm like, we had what two sacks against him, maybe two to three sacks against him. We still mm-hmm. had sacks against him, but it's not as much as we apply our standard to. So yeah, and something that I I've mainly interviewed uh, receivers. I work at Prolific Park. Uh, Ricky Prohl's the owner of it. Former Ram played 17 years. Played with the Rams, Panthers. Um, I've interviewed DeAndre Tompkins who was briefly with the Packers practice squad, played over NC State. TJ Graham played for NC State. So I've interviewed receivers and also just watching Ricky play the or coach the receiver position. It's really opened up my mind to um the art form almost that receiver is and how much more complex an offense is and how much more complex football is in general and something I don't think the average fan realizes. So as a defensive tackle, what do you think is the most complex part of the position or maybe some nuance to it that the average fan doesn't think about or someone in your comment section doesn't think about when they're hating on your guy's performance or something like that? I'll say 100%, not 100%, but obviously nose guard. Um, I'm like, I'm just going to put myself out there. So nose guard, to all the, to everyone who's watching, nose guard is it's not as the, – the responsibility isn't as uh, heavy or isn't as uh, – uh, uh, um, that was the word I was looking for complex oh it's, it's definitely complex it's just it's yeah. not as spoken about all the time you always hear yeah QB, yeah, yeah. You always hear qb running back receiver all that stuff and that's it it's, it's, it's typical uh big play guys and stuff like that you're going to see a big play but only the real ones know what the, who's who made a big play in certain place and so um if i do say so myself nose guard has to be one of the least thought about one of the least thought about positions on the field when it comes to responsibility um you see guys like um uh Duvis johnson who are making play TFLs in the backfield? I'm like because if we're running, if we're running a three down front, I gotta hold up three. I gotta hold up two guys who are 300 pounds, and the only way I can open up that gap is by occupying that guard. If I'm lined up on the center, um, yeah. I'm strike. If I'm striking, if I'm in the three tech and I'm striking, uh, if it's a stretch my way and I'm striking the guard, he cuts back and a and a linebacker or a DN makes that play. There's a dynamics within that defense because it's a teamwork effort. So if I'm making, if I'm making, a, if I make, I made a play as well. If he made a play on the backside, why I closed out that whole opportunity for him to even get around the the uh, our, the line of scrimmage or even get around our defense because I set a, a firm edge and so that's why he cut back and this is why we made a play. And so it's just a, it's a very it's a very uh, unthought of uh, responsibility on the field, especially when it comes to if you're not one of those Noah's guard who is. We're very good at pass rushing, and I'm not, I'm not discrediting myself, but if I'm not out there making sacks every play, you will never know who this guy is on the field. But someone yeah. else, someone knows, and the only piece, the only people we know, only people we want to know about this guy who's playing a uh, 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 nose guard is the people who have that shield on their chest. That's the only people <laughs> we want to know. It doesn't really matter what the fans say. Oh, the fans, yeah. Like, oh my gosh, uh, Smile One is a really great uh, linebacker. Like he has to be underrated. Well. Oh, yeah, he can't be a great linebacker without his uh his uh, uh swifty nose guard. Come in, Brandon. Um, it's my brother. <laughs> What's up? <laughs> Are you home right now? 
Oh, no, I'm in my dorm. I'm actually gonna go home. He's coming. He's coming to get me from the car. I'm on <laughs> Oh, if you if you gotta go soon, we can we can wrap this up. Yeah, that was coming to get me. Um, I was unaware about that, but uh, <laughs> it was great. It, 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 we can wrap it up now, but it was great talking to you. And uh, you know, anytime we can get on here, we can talk about whatever. I, I, I enjoy that a lot. Yeah, since you have to go, I really appreciate you going ahead and hopping on here with me. I I think if if I'm make a recommendation to you, you should definitely do some more long form stuff, just giving your opinion on stuff because you are a great speaker and giving your opinion. So idea just for YouTube because I know you like doing that comedy and stuff. If I were you, I don't know. I don't remember. I uh, know if you've seen it, but the um Viking stuff that I forget his name. The defensive ended a bunch of years ago, where he'd go and like ask the six, the six questions, to, like Stefan Diggs and like people in the locker room okay. and stuff like that. That's something that I think if you did that, like in the Georgia locker room with a bunch of your guys, yeah, and like did some of those questions. I, I want to say it's Brian Robinson was his name, but when he did those questions, those videos used to pop off. So if you did that and like edited it in a way, I think that'd be a great thing to start um your YouTube channel. On as far as getting more views over there well, i appreciate that man I'm, a, I'm gonna look into it definitely and definitely if you're ever willing to come back on again would love to have you on i think it was a great conversation i definitely related to you on a bunch of stuff just as far as how you think about things so it was no, it was awesome to have you on good luck to your season maybe we can have you on again and i i really appreciate it yeah we can definitely get on soon i appreciate you as well all right have a have a great day you too